please be seated. <laughs> wow, look at you. It is an honor for me to be here. I am uh, been looking forward to this since I was invited. We tried to make things work last year, but it, uh, my schedule just it, uh, didn't work. But uh, I am glad to be here. This is my first time in Red Deer. But uh, thank you. It's great, great to be here. But I've been, I've been all over Canada. In fact, I had a dream a number of years ago where an angel came to me and said, uh, you're going to take out dual citizenship with Canada. You're going to be there so much. And so I've been, I, I feel like the Johnny Cash song, I've been everywhere, man. Uh, I've been in St. John and St. John's. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, Halifax, clear to Prince Edward Island, uh, I mean, up to Prince Edward Island and over to, to Vancouver and Victoria and Thunder Bay back toward the east and just uh, everywhere. And the Lord has given me great favor with, uh, with the First Nations people and I've been doing some things uh, with them and I'm, uh, I feel like I'm like dual citizenship with you, so... I don't quite have the accent down, uh, especially Peter was talking about, about noticing the difference between this province and this province. It's still just Canadian to me. <laughs> eh? <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, and if I sound like Texan, it's because that's where I was born, in Texas. So I tried to get rid of the accent, but once in a while it sneaks out. So you'll know where, my, where I come from. I've been in ministry for over 30 years now. I've been doing prophetic ministry that whole time. I started out in the, in the corporate world, thinking I was going to be the CEO of some major corporation, but God, God had other plans. And when Peter said that, that I'm here by divine appointment, I think we all are here by divine appointment. I know I am here by divine appointment. Uh, the Lord really opens doors for me and shows me where I should go, and uh, is, it is, his timing is amazing. But I've, I've also noticed something else, and that is this. Things don't always work out like I think they will. Now, I'm, I may be the only one here that has that problem. God says for me to do something, and I have a plan. I mean, my mind automatically goes toward, then let's make a plan. And I have a strategy, and I work out systems to, to make things happen. That's my tendency to do that. But nothing works out like I plan. And I can truthfully say that. I mean, maybe there's a, a few degrees difference. Sometimes it's close. Other times, it's the exact opposite of what I thought was going to happen. You could take a look at many men and women in the Bible. You take a look at Joseph, who was to have kings bow down to him. And even his brothers were to bow down to him. And he was sold into slavery by the very ones who were to bow. You could take a look at, at Moses, who was to lead his people out of, of, of captivity, and he was exiled from the people he was to lead out of captivity. All throughout Scripture, you can see the opposites, almost like the opposites of God. And what I would like to do tonight is, Lord willing, I would like to talk to you tonight about what is God doing when things don't work out like you planned. So, Father, please help me to communicate this so that it touches the hearts of the people even as you have touched my heart with it, and I've watched it play out over the decades. You are great and awesome. We don't understand you, but we do trust you. Your, your ways are so high above ours. But Lord, we trust that you know the future. You know tomorrow. You know why you placed us on earth right now. You could have chosen any time in history or even in the future, and you chose now. We were designed for that. Help us to understand your ways. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. In, 
Exodus 33, Moses is up on top of a mountain, and he, the Lord is talking to Moses, and he says, I know you by name. Moses responds by saying, well then, if you know me by name, and I have that kind of favor with you, then there's three things I want from you. I, first of all, I want you to teach me your ways so that I might know you. Number two, I want your presence to go with us. Number three, I want to see your glory. Now today, if we were given that same opportunity from God, we would probably say, show me your glory first. We might say, let your presence go with us second. Few of us would probably say, I want to know your ways. That might be way down the list. With Moses, it was number one. Why? Because he, well, let me back up. You see, Moses was no slacker at this time. And this is the Moses that already had thrown his rod down twice and become a snake. Once at the burning bush, once in front of Pharaoh. This is the Moses that had, that had started ten plagues and stopped ten plagues. This is the Moses that held out his rod and the waters parted and the ground was instantly dry. This is the Moses that had pulled up his rod and the waters closed and all the Egyptian army drowned. This is the Moses that struck a rock, and enough water came out of this rock to, to give water to over a million and a half people. This Moses was no slouch, and he's standing on top of the mountain after having done all of this, and he's in essence saying, I've done all these miracles, and I have no clue who you are. You see, there's a difference between knowing God and knowing about God. And Moses was finding he knew about God, but he didn't know God. It's very important that we start making a transition, especially in light of the things that are coming up on the earth, to transition from knowing about God to knowing God. I know about movie stars and pro athletes. You read them about them. You listen to them on the news. All kinds of things. I know about them, but I don't know Hardly any of them. I think many of us are in that same place with God. We may know about him, but do we really, really know him? Knowing his ways is vitally important. It will save you from making wrong financial investments. It will save you from hiring the wrong people. It will save you from building, manufacturing, inventing the wrong product. There's nothing that knowing the God won't knowing God won't help you in. Nothing. There's nothing you can't do better by getting closer to Him. And there's things that are waiting for you to invent, are waiting for you to discover, are waiting for you as ideas that will come into your head for your business or for the for the company that you're working for that will promote you. And all that is waiting is you to get closer to Him. See, getting closer to him, we tap into the idea, the most intellectual, greater than any computer, the idea of everything that even exists started in him and it was created by him. You can tap into that, but it takes close proximity to do it. Otherwise, you will have sprinkles of ideas, but nothing consistent. Sometimes we don't, we don't get close to God because we're afraid of what he'll say. Like, you take him away. Sometimes we don't want to get close to God because we've been disillusioned by what we thought God was going to do, and he didn't. And so we're still hurt or angry or disappointed, or we think we can't trust him. What is God doing when things don't work out the way you planned? David found himself in that situation often. Often. If you will, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 27. We're going to begin there, but before we do, let me just give you kind of a history of this this interaction between David and Saul. Because we're going to look a little bit at Saul, 
But we're going to look a lot, a lot at David. We find David, well, let's back up. We find Saul is anointed to be king in about 1047 B.C. 1047 years B.C. We know something must be up because when we look for Saul to be anointed, Saul can't be found anywhere. And what we discover is that Saul was hiding in the baggage. And right now we know one thing real clear. Saul had a fear of people. That's why he was hiding. It wasn't that he didn't want to be king. He was afraid of what the people would say if Samuel anointed him to be king. After only one year, Saul violates God's authority, the separation between the king and the priest, thinks Samuel is late, decides he's going to offer the burnt offerings that the priest is to offer, and that, and the reason he did that, because the people were getting restless because Samuel wasn't there. So Saul thinks, I'll, I can do this. And I'll make the people have peace. That move right there, Samuel told him, will cost you, your kingdom will not be passed on to your children. Because you did that. What we come to understand is that the higher the leadership, the fewer mistakes can be made and the greater the cost of every mistake. The people became restless, and so he felt the pressure of the people. Nine years later, ten years into his reign, Saul again would fear the people. This time, he is told to, to go into a country, invade it, and kill everything, including Agag the king. Saul decides that he is going to take it upon himself to bring Agag back to Jerusalem. And he's going to display Agag before who? The people. Why? Because he wanted to impress the people. Why do you want to impress the people? Because you want the people to think good of you. Why? Because if they think bad of you, somebody may rise up against you and take your kingdom away. And here we see Saul is not trusting God, he is trusting the people. And this time, the kingdom isn't just taken away from his family, it is taken away from him. And from that moment on, Saul begins to have a distressing spirit troubling him every single day for the rest of his life. And the only relief he had was when a 17-year-old named David began to play for him. This spirit then would trouble him another 32 years before he would die in battle. Samuel, that day, would begin to mourn for Saul. At the very same time, the kingdom was being taken away from Saul. Saul was fail, failed to kill Agag. Samuel began to mourn, said it was going to be given to another man. Something happened in the family of Jesse. A young boy was born, and his name was David. Seventeen years would go by. The very year that Saul said, failed to kill Agag, that year, David was born. They wouldn't meet for 17 years. For 17 years, Samuel grieved, mourned, until God said, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? Now get up, go anoint David. Now he didn't say David, he said, a son of Jesse. He goes to Jesse. Jesse has all these sons, six sons. None of them are it. says, hey, Samuel says, don't you have another son? Because none of these are it. God told me one of your sons is going to be king. And Jesse goes, well, I got the little one. 
his young, he's out with the sheep. That's not like, and by saying that, you can almost hear Jesse saying, he's not king material. David came in, Spirit of the Lord comes on Samuel, God says this is him, he anoints David the first time to be king, David is 17. By this time, David has already slain a lion with his bare hands. He has already slain a bear with his bare hands. Nobody knows it yet, except David and God. Shortly thereafter, while he's still 17, he visits his brother, and there's Goliath. And as a 17-year-old, he picks up five stones and uses one and kills Goliath. Shortly after that, it was found out that he was a musician and he began, to, he began to be able to play for Saul and this distressing spirit would leave Saul. Eight years later, when he was 25, he was running from Saul and Samuel anointed him to be king for the second time. Samuel would die three years later at 110 years of age David would be 28, Saul would be 69, David would be in the wilderness and would not be able to attend the funeral of Samuel. Saul would die at about 72 years of age. David would become king in Hebron about 1011 BC at 30 years of age. He would spend seven years in Hebron. When he was 37, he would become king in Jerusalem. He would be king for 33 years more, a total of 40 years before David would die when he was 70 years of age. But there is a crucial moment in this whole timeline, a crucial moment, for the saying that Saul, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes is true. To everything there is a season, a time, and a purpose under heaven, a time to live a time to die, a time to, be, a time to reap, a time to sow. And so what I want to do is I want to point out to you what happens when things don't work out the way you plan. What is God doing when things don't work out the way you plan? So 1 Samuel chapter 27. What we find here in verse 1 is this. David said in his heart, Saul's going to kill me now. Now, that wasn't true, and it's good he didn't say it out loud, but he did say it in his heart. David has just spared Saul's life a second time. First time in the cave, Saul's using the bathroom, David cuts off part of the robe and, and feels guilty about it. This time, God puts a deep sleep on the entire army, including Saul, and his head captains, the guards, everybody. David walks into the, into the, to the camp, and everybody's asleep. He takes the, Saul from spear, from, I mean, takes the spear from Saul's head, right by his head. So then if something happens, Saul can wake up, grab a spear. So David takes the spear, takes a jug of water, Saul's personal jug of water, walks up to the top of the hill, shouts back down at Saul and says, Hey, I could have killed you again. I'm not out to kill you. I'm not out to take your kingdom away from you. I love you. I'm a faithful son. Saul repents. And, you'll, and we find that Saul doesn't chase David anymore. But neither can David go back to Jerusalem, and neither can David go anywhere but out in the wilderness. And he makes friends with this guy named Achish, this Philistine. And Achish is a very wealthy man. Achish is like a general. He is a, a, a man of renown amongst the Philistines, and David makes friends with Achish. Now, Achish is like a head up in the, in the army, and David, and he's a very wealthy man, and David becomes like a son to Achish. And Achish sees David and knows that the people of Israel know, utterly abhor David. And in fact, that's what it says in verse 12. So Achish believed David and said, He has made the people, his people Israel, utterly abhor him. 
And David was faithful in everything that he was doing. But David would go out on these raiding parties to southern Israel, southern the southern area, even as far as Egypt. And he would go out on these raiding parties and he would bring back all this loot, gold and silver and bronze and, and precious stones. And, and, and he came to Kish and says, hey, I've got 600 men following me. They got wives. They got children. We got, we've got no place to stay. We're out like out in the desert and our wives are complaining. And so Akish says, hey, take Ziklag. I'll give you Ziklag. Now Ziklag was between Beersheba and the Gaza Strip area as we know it today. Ziklag was in between those two, Gaza and Beersheba. And so David goes down to Ziklag, he and his 600 men and their wives, and they lived there for almost a year and a half, a year and four months. At the end of this year and four months, Saul and David haven't seen each other. And this is kind of an interesting time. In chapter 28, we start finding for the timeline of David and Saul and the clash of the kingdoms is taking shape. Verse 1 of chapter 28 says this, And it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. We go on to read in that same passage that Achish says to David, Hey, you know you're going to war with me against your people, thinking they had only abhor him. And David goes, Of course I am. And David really was going to war with them. And we know that because when we read over in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, we find out that the Bible tells us that it says, and when David was going to go to war against his people Israel. So we know he was really going to do that. He wasn't pretending. So they're thinking this is going to happen. Two meetings are going on at the exact same time time. Again, think back. Saul's kingdom is taken away, and the very year it's taken, David's born. And Samuel said, it is given to your neighbor. Two meetings are happening this day. This one meeting is David and Achish, and they're talking about tomorrow we're going to go to war. At the same time, Saul is in a meeting. This meeting is not with the Kish. This meeting is with Samuel through the witch of Endor. Now you think, why would Saul go to the witch of Endor? Well, one, Saul had put all the mediums and clairvoyants and psychics out of Jerusalem, and so they had to go somewhere. The question is, why would they go to Endor? Well, they went to Endor because Endor, the city Endor, was in the tribal area of Issachar. And the tribal area of Issachar, the men of Issachar were known to be men of renown, men who knew time, signs, seasons. In other words, very, very prophetic in nature. And so where do you think the witches would go if driven out of Jerusalem Where do you think they would kind of naturally gravitate to, especially if the people of Issachar weren't using their gift for God? And when you read the scripture, you find out during the time of Samuel, they were worshiping Baal and Molech and all kinds of of, of, uh, idols. And so when a gift isn't used for God, it it will then corrupt and be used by the evil one. That's why the witch of Endor and others like her, they migrated then to Endor, which is, by the way, just northwest in northern Israel, northwest of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, now, Saul is meeting in that, David is meeting with with Achish for battle against Saul, and Saul is meeting with the witch of Endor or meeting with Samuel. Samuel it is called up. Now, why was Saul meeting with the witch of Endor? It tells us right here in verse, verse 6. It says this, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him by dreams or by 
Urim or by prophets. Now, well, that's interesting, isn't it? What was the first thing it said? God did not speak to Saul by dreams. Well, today we're like, dreams? Dreams? Here, it's mentioned first, like the first thing kings expected was God to give them a dream. What happened today? What happened? I wonder how many presidents or premiers or, or, or leaders of nations go to bed at night thinking, oh God, give me a dream and give me the answer. But it was common. It was common then for the kings of Israel. And if you think dreams are strange, try looking at the Urim. You go, what was the Urim? The Urim was one of two stones in the pouch of the breastplate of the high priest. You see, the ephod, the breastplate of the high priest, wasn't just a a piece of cloth with 12 stones on it. It was a piece of cloth with 12 stones on it that was a pouch, and behind it, the 12 stones in the pouch were two stones. One Urim, one Thummim, and they would light up. And when they lit up, they would tell you yes or no, and when to go. And they would vibrate, and the vibration of those stones sounded just like a voice, like God. And so when it says, go inquire of the high priest, bring me the ephod, and inquire of the Lord, should I go to war or not? He would bring in the ephod and those two stones, and the tribes would light up saying, this is the one to go first, this is how it should be done. And, they would, and you would hear the voice of God through those two stones that would light up. So if you think dreams are strange, try the Urim and Thummim. <laughs> and if that's not strange enough for you, try the prophets. That was the third one. I said, if the Urim doesn't work and the dreams don't work, then I'll send the prophets in. It's like, it's like when the prophets come, oh no. I blew the first two. That's what the kings would say. I said, the prophets are coming, I must have blown the first two options. And that's why I was there. Are you coming in peace? And most of the time they go, no. Once in a while, they'd say, we'll see. So, so Saul is not being spoken to. He goes to the witch of Endor. witch of Endor calls, up, calls uh, uh, this guy up, Samuel. And he comes up, and Samuel says, and it says, Samuel said to Saul. I think when it says Samuel said to Saul, it means it was Samuel. Now, let's just put on hold right here. How did that work? How did that work? Some people said, well, it, were, it couldn't have been Samuel. He wouldn't have come back from the dead. Well, the Bible says it was Samuel. So I think it was Samuel. I believe this Bible. Okay, number two. Who controlled Sheol? Well, first of all, where did everybody go when they died? I'll give you a hint. Heaven wasn't open yet. I'll give you another hit. Neither was paradise. So where did they go? It, it begins, it's a holding tank. And the holding tank, the name of the holding tank means barren womb. And it begins with an S and it ends with an L. Sheol, oh, very good. You're quick. Sheol, everybody went to Sheol, means barren womb. Samuel was in Sheol. Everybody went there. Adam went there. Eve went there. Cain went there. Abel went there. Everybody went to Sheol. Noah went there. Shem, Hem, Japheth went there. All the descendants went there. Everybody went to Sheol because guess who controlled the afterlife? I'll give you a hint. The name begins an S and ends with an N. No, not Satan. (laughs) Satan controlled it. How do we know that? We know that because in Luke chapter 4, Satan comes to Jesus tempts him, and he says, see all these kingdoms? I will give it to you along with their authority because it has been delivered to me who delivered it to him. Begins with an A, ends with an M. Adam, exactly. Adam gave it to Satan. Satan had control of death, hell, and the grave. When everybody died, they were under the rule of Satan because Satan had been given everything up to that point on earth. So, Samuel 
was under the control of Satan. No wonder he was angry, because when you read this, he says, and Samuel was angry. And when he was called up, why would he be angry? Because he, a righteous man, had to obey the rule over him. Satan said, Samuel, go up. No. Samuel, I've been given authority. You go up. He had to go. He was angry. And here's what he says. He says, why have you called me up? Because the Lord is through with you. He's no longer talking to you. And in fact, this time tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Guess where that me was? Sheol, exactly. You and your sons will be with me. See, Sheol didn't empty until this incredible day when suddenly theology changed. How did the theology change? Up until this point, to the time of Jesus, everybody who died went to Sheol. The day before Jesus died, the guy that died went to Sheol. The day he died, went to Sheol. Everyone except for maybe, maybe, maybe the thief. But the thief may have gone with Jesus and then made a U-turn. But here's how it works. So everybody that has died is in Sheol now. David, Saul, everybody. Jesus is on the cross. The thief is on the cross. He thinks he's going to Sheol like everybody's gone to Sheol. Jesus says, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. The thief's going, paradise? Sounds a lot better than Sheol. Paradise, Sheol. I'll choose paradise. Where's paradise? See, what he was said is, from this moment on, everybody who dies believing in me doesn't go there. They go to paradise. Major shift. Major shift. Now that, but that was, that was 3,000 years after David saw. So 3,000 years is a long time to collect people. And that's what Sheol did. It collected people. It was a holding tank until Jesus came. And then everybody who believed in Jesus left with him to paradise. And some of those stopped on the way on the surface of the earth, Matthew tells us, to tell what Jesus said, the good news, in Sheol, while they left, and everybody went to paradise, and they probably, at some point, went to paradise, too. I don't know how all that worked. We can surmise that they just kind of disappeared, like Enoch. God took them. You know, walking around the corner, they were, then they were not. Don't know how it happened, but then we don't even know how many, but we do know this. Josephus says that it was reported during that time that even Zechariah the prophet walked the streets of Jerusalem testifying to the strange events that had happened that day. Well, well that's the witch of Endor. Now, simultaneously, in the Bible, they, they don't use this word meanwhile. So David and Saul are... I mean, Saul is with the witch of Endor and Samuel, and meanwhile, David is marching with Achish in front of the Philistine generals. It says that they were marching by the hundreds and by the thousands, and they were in their, their ceremonial parade, going before the, before the, 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 the generals of the Philistines and, and kind of pumping themselves up for the war that was going to happen starting the next day. David and the 600 men are at the very end of the parade. You can imagine the, the thumping of the chest and the, the, the adrenaline that was flowing. And David says, well, I'm, I'm going to be I'm a, like a general in Achish's army. And then the Philistine lords, they see David and they go, what is this Hebrew doing here? We don't, what are you talking, Achish, what are you doing? It says, and they were angry. This guy's not fighting with us. Send him home tomorrow by daylight. Akish goes back to David and says, David, you guys, come here. David, you can't go to battle with us. 
Now, when you're a warrior and a king, but you're not a king, but you've been anointed twice, you're thinking, what are my men going to say? And the men are thinking, this guy, nothing is happening. We've been following a guy for several years. We've hidden in a cave with the guy. We ran and got water for the guy. We've almost been killed for the guy. And now even his enemies reject him. Why are we following this guy? So the king, is David, is going, Oy vey. They're, so they're down-spirited. They're downtrodden. They're going back to Ziklag with a tail between their legs. They get to Ziklag and matters get worse. Ziklag is empty. It's burning. No kids in the streets. No wives. No servants. No gold. No bronze. No silver. No precious stones. No goats. No sheep. No cattle. No donkeys, nothing. And his men go, this is it. We've had it. Verse chapter 30 says this, verse 6. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. It wasn't just that we're going to quit following you. We're going to kill you. I don't know about you, but stoning's pretty serious. And all of a sudden, the men, who were, the men who were getting him water were now the ones picking up the stones. And David says, just a second, I'm going to go seek the Lord. But first, he said, I am going to strengthen myself in God first. Now, wait a minute. Why, did, why didn't he seek God first and then strengthen himself? It says, and he strengthened himself. What would strengthening yourself look or sound like? Probably what David did was this. He remembered what Samuel had said. That's part of why I wrote Psalm 77, where it says this, this. I said this in my anguish, and I did this in my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your works of old. David remembered when he remembered. I remembered Samuel anointing me. I remember twice they called me out. I remember slaying the bear. I remember God was with me. I remember slaying the lion, and God was with me. I remember slaying Goliath, and God was with me. God is with me, this incredible God that I serve. He remembered Psalm 71, 17, From my youth you have taught me, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. So 75.1, we give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your wondrous works, for your name is near. We declare, your, for your wondrous works, we declare that your name is near. David remembered this incredible God that has been with him. And he said, I will remember Jehovah Sid Canoe, my righteousness. The Lord, my righteousness is with me. Jehovah Mishpat, the Lord my justice is with me. Jehovah Cheshed, the Lord who is merciful is with me. Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies is with me. Jehovah Megan, the Lord my shield is with me. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace is with me. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who is healing is with me. Jehovah Yireh, the Lord who provides is with me. 
Jehovah Nissi, my banner, the Lord my banner is with me. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd is with me. Jehovah Nagad, the Lord that predicts the future is with me. The Jehovah Ava, the Lord who is love, is with me. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord who is worthy of worship, is with me. Jehovah Kwana, the Lord who is jealous for me, is with me. Jehovah Elyon, the Lord's supreme God, is with me. Jehovah Olam, the Lord who is eternal, uncaused, self-sustaining, existent one, is with me. Jehovah Hayah, the self-sufficient one, is with me. Jehovah Kadosh, the Lord who is holy and pure and undefiled, is with me. Jehovah Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, the Omnipotent One, is with me. Jehovah Oar, the Lord is my light and darkness, luminous, glorying one, is with me. Jehovah Kabod, the weighty glory of God, is with me. I will remember him. He has never failed me. He has never let me down. I may not understand him, but I trust him. David remembered God had a plan. God had helped him in every facet. David remembered what Samuel had prophesied over him. David remembered God had chosen him. He had prepared him. He wrote Psalms 139, and he said this, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are all written, the days fashioned for me, when yet there was none of them. David understood God. He knew God. More than knew about him, he knew him. And he knew the greatness of God would prevail. And therefore, if he could just find God's plan, it would all work. Now, now that David was full of faith, now David could seek the Lord. You see, if you don't get anything out of this message tonight, get this. Never seek God when your faith is weak. What do we do most of the time? My boss is about to fire me. Oh, God, you've got to help me. We go from crisis to seeking God instead of strengthening ourselves in God and then going to him full of faith, remembering what God will do, what God has done, reminding ourselves of where we are in him. We will come before him automatically with faith in our heart, and he will answer the cry of faith. David understood this. Then he inquired of God, and God said, yes, go after him. You're going to get him back. David goes out to go get him and has to leave 200 behind. So his troops get smaller. I've got to fight the enemy with fewer, not greater, numbers. That's okay. God's with me. You guys stay. We're going. He goes, and he just so happens to find the servant in the middle of the desert, who the uh, Amalekite, had left behind because he was sick, and the servant just so happened to get sick. And so he could get left behind, so he could tell where they went. Hmm, what a coincidence. He tells them where they're going. David takes off after them. He gets all of them. He gets all of his stuff back from Ziklag. Gets all the children back, all the servants back, all the wives back, all everything back, including everything that the Amalekites had taken from about ten other cities that they had raided other than Ziklag. He gets it all back. But this isn't the rest of the story. See, because we still don't know what is God doing? What... What do we do when it doesn't, doesn't work out the way we planned? What is God doing when, when things don't work out the way we planned? We don't know that answer yet. Here's what he's doing. Let's go back to David and Saul, the battle that almost was. What if God would have allowed David to fight in that battle? 
one thing we know would have happened. We know that somewhere in the battle it says this. Saul was on a hill, he and his sons, and he was surrounded by the archers. And he knew he was going to die. At that point, the Philistine generals would have said, David, where's David? David, you go kill him. And if you don't kill him, we're going to kill you. You said you were with us, you kill him. God protected David from that moment. But there's more. Had David fought in that battle, he would have never recovered his wives. They would have been gone. Gone. See, it was three days before he got back. Had he fought in that battle, they would have been fighting and they would have been cleaning up and they would have been pillaging for the next week. David would have never got his wives and children back. But that's still not the story. Had David come come back to Ziklag before the Amalekites had invaded, he would have missed something even more. You see, the loot we read that the loot that they got from the Amalekites because of all the cities that they had raided in addition to Ziklag was so great, David not only gave it to all 600 men, even the 200 that didn't go into battle, David divided up part of the spoils and sent it as a peace offering to all 12 tribes. It was so much. And here's what we find out. The kingdom of David for the next seven years was funded by that confiscation of the battle. The next seven years, while while Ishbosheth and all those guys were fighting on who's going to be king in Jerusalem, David was funded in Hebron for seven years by that battle. Man. Here's six things God did for David in that moment, in that short time span. God protected David from being forced to kill Saul. God provided for David by the plunder of the Amalekites. God propelled David by the plunder to Ziklag. I'm sorry, so he could get the plunder. God propelled David to his destiny by getting him to Ziklag. God produced a crisis in Ziklag that would rally men to David and realize he is the king we wanted to serve. God promoted David by his leadership during the crisis of Ziklag. And God pronounced the kingship of David by giving him favor with the people. God protected, provided, propelled, produced, promoted, and pronounced. All in what looked like utter defeat. What is God doing when things don't work out like you planned? He's promoting you. You just don't know it yet. He's providing for you. You just don't know it yet. He's protecting you. You just don't know it yet. He's propelling you to your destiny. You just don't know it yet. There's one thing we do know, that we as children of God, his hand is upon us. No matter what the enemy does, all six of those things are going to happen in our lives if we know him. Not just know about him. If we know him. Our current church culture is not teaching us really to know him. I'm not talking about every single church. There are churches that that are, are, are doing a great job. But the culture itself 
Even the church culture is not teaching us to know him. It's teaching us about him. It's teaching us about him. See, there's so many things. If we can, when we read this word, this incredible word of God right here, this teaches us of his ways. Incredible. There's, an, there's a, a remarkable story. I hadn't planned on talking about this, but I'm, I feel like I need to share this. Just to kind of add the emphasis to it. There's an incredible story in here about David as king. And there comes a period of time when David is now king in Jerusalem, and everything is really going well, that there's fam, uh, drought and famine because of that. And so David inquires of the Lord, why, why are we having this drought? Why are we having this famine? And the, the Lord says, it's because of what Saul did to, oh dear, this, these guys, Gibeonites. Thank you, the Gibeonites. What Saul did to the Gibeonites. Now, the, now you say, well, what Saul did to the Gibeonites, that was 40 years earlier. 40 years. Years earlier, Saul, trying to clean up the land, goes after all the Philistines and attacks the village of the Gibeonites, kills all the men, which was against the treaty that Joshua made with the Gibeonites, even though he did it because he was deceived by them. He still made the treaty, not to invade or to kill any of them. But Saul kills them. Now, that treaty was three, over 300, almost 400 years earlier. Does God have a memory or what? Now, Saul kills him. 40 years later, the judgment comes in David's era. Drought is on the land. What Saul did the Gibeonites, David goes to the Gibeonites. Saul, God tells him, you go to the Gibeonites and do what they say. He goes to the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites says, give us seven of Saul's descendants. We're going to kill them. In other words, and it says hang on a tree. Whenever you read that word hang on a tree, it means crucify. It doesn't mean like with a rope. The hanging on a tree is not like put a rope around their neck. The hanging on the tree is exactly what happened to Jesus, exactly what happened, and they strung them up, pierced their hands, pierced their feet, broke their legs, dead. So David's now going to turn over seven of Saul's descendants. You look around, you go, well, Mephibosheth is the only son existing. What do I do? I, I made a treaty. I made a, 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 an, a, an agreement with, with, with Mephibosheth not to kill him. And I've told everybody, he is going to eat at my table the rest of his life, so I can't give him Mephibosheth. Who do I give him? So he starts looking for grandsons. And he finds seven grandsons. He finds two of them with one, with one of Saul's daughters, and he finds four of them, I mean five of them, being watched by his wife, Michael. Now, why was Michael watching them? Because Mirab, their mother, had died. So her sister had to watch the five children of Mirab, Saul's daughter, the oldest daughter of Saul. Michael being the youngest daughter of Saul. Michael, you might remember, was barren. Now she's watching five children, grandchildren of Saul. David takes those five grandchildren and the other two grandchildren and has to, has to, doesn't have a choice. There's only seven remaining. Has to give them to the Gibeonites who hanged them, crucified them. Now you say, well, how's that relate to what we're talking about earlier? Here's how it relates. Had Michael had children, David would have had to send his own children to the Gibeonites. Michael was Saul's daughter, and if she'd had any children, he would have had to give her children, his children, to the Gibeonites. So 
God as punishment. God could have picked out any number of ways to punish Michael. Why did he pick out barrenness? To protect David. Now, Michael's not thinking he's being protected. David's not thinking he's being protected. He's thinking, I've got a wife and I'm not going to have any descendants from this wife. But God knew, I'm protecting David. He won't know it for a number of years yet, but I'm protecting David. Now, how do you get to know God's ways? When you read this word, I'm going to give you a tip. Ask continually, every day. I read this Bible an hour or more every day. I don't just read it. I study this. Why do I study this? Here's how I do it. I say, God, why did you do it that way and not that way? If you can just ask, why this and not that? You will find the ways of God. What would have happened if Michael would have had children? When you you read this Bible and you say, why this and not that? This Bible will come alive. You will learn the ways of God. Teach me your ways that I might know you. You want to know God, it starts reading this. You say, well, I think I'll pray. Great, but you better read this. This word is living. It enters into your spirit into your life, into your thought processes, into your brain. You will make better decisions when you read this daily. You will make, have better discernment when you read this daily. You will know right from wrong when you read this daily. You will understand truth when you read this daily. You will recognize patterns when you read this daily. You have better inventions, innovations. You have better systems. You have better work ethics when you read this daily. What we are missing, we are missing knowing God, and one of the elements of knowing God is this, and you can't know him deeply without knowing this. Earlier, Peter talked about transformation. The Bible says transformation starts with the renewing of your mind. What I've just told you will renew your mind, and it will... Start the transformation process. Without the renewing of your mind, there is no transformation. You must renew your mind how you think about the Word, how you think about God, how you think about His Spirit, how you think about His presence, how you think about His ways, how you think about who He is. You have to renew your mind. And right now our culture is fighting you to try to stop you from renewing your mind through this. You want to have prophetic utterances? Read this. You want to have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all nine of them? Read this. You want to see people raised from the dead? It starts reading this. You want to, you want to know what's coming in the future? It starts by reading that. That begins your life in God. That begins your way of knowing him, and his prophets know him. The only ones who don't are found in Daniel chapter 7. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 7, where it says, But Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and heal in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't do miracles in your name? And he goes, Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. You say, well, how did he do that? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. The people had needs, but the person was not using God. Did they heal the person? No. Jesus healed, honored his, honored his name, but the person who did it was lawless. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's exactly where Moses was on the mountain. I do these miracles, but I don't know him. That's where much of the church is today. 
we know about him, we don't know him. That has to change. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua Mashiach, Ben Eli, the Son of God, may you take this message tonight and may it begin this camp meeting and may by the end of this camp meeting there be such a transformation of knowing you. I am so honored you would have me speak amongst all these noted guests that are coming. Surely your hand is at work in all of this. May your name be praised. May your kingdom be advanced. May Jesus be lifted up. May evil be destroyed. May your, may your purposes unfold in your people in ways we can't even anticipate tonight. But may none of us close our eyes tonight and go to sleep without longing to know you. Will you, O oh God, put it in our heart, a longing to know you? If you find yourself in that place, you find, you know what, I, I need to know. I want to know God. I'm not going to ask you to come down here to the front. There may be too many. But I am going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. And I want to say a prayer with you. You want to know this God you serve. Not just know about him. Know him. And recognize, even when things don't turn out like you planned, God was really at work. So, Father, you see this people. You see them raising their hands before you. May, by their raising of their hands, may it form a connection with you, and may you give and grant unto them a hunger in their heart that cannot be quenched to know you. May it, may it proceed from knowing about you to knowing you. Not just knowing I'm saved, I believe in you. Yes, but the Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. So it's more than just believing. And it's more than just knowing about. I ask you, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to come upon this people and to come and to touch their hands, touch their bodies, touch their minds, renew their minds, and start and release in them a way of knowing you, O oh God. Give them dreams and visions. Open your word to them. Give them visitations. Give them trances. But no oh God, speak to them. And may your word become vital in their life. May they not be able to go a day without reading it. Create such a hunger in them, even when they can't say, I can't read. May they be able to. Amen. When they say, <coughs> when they say, I have dyslexia, turn the words around. Let nothing stand in the way, oh God, of them knowing you. Prayer, yes but not to the neglect of your word. May we become a people of renown, a people to bring you praise, a people who would glorify you. Now, when those who don't know you look at us, there will be a clear distinction between us and them for your glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. So be it. Amen. Amen.